Hi, everyone. This is Amr. Thank you for attending. And thank you to Dr. Garg for giving the presentation. So I'll let her go on from here. And hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the end, she was saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so basically, uh, I wanted to... Um, well, actually, Amr, I think you had mentioned that you you started this new Facebook group and you were you reached out to people for presentations for topics and I said I can talk about lifestyle medicine um in a DPC hybrid practice um and so that's kind of where we started right I think and then yes yeah, yeah. and I just really want to help people like just any any way I can to get you know to get started in this and so this presentation is as much for you um you know there's like whatever you need out of this you just ask me you're the ones that are here you know like this I don't want you to waste your time you know just get what you need out of this um you know I've been doing it for a couple of years now so hopefully I'll have your answers if not I can definitely try to source that for you but I just want to try to help people get this because you know everybody doing it will help everybody else doing it because this is something that not a lot of people still know about yet and it's right. so important and so key. And I love it. I love what I'm doing. So I think, um, you know, anything that I, that's why I was just like, I really want to, you know, share what I've learned um, and share the process. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, let's see, let's go to the next slide. So the outline for my talk is just three simple things. I'm going to do a little bit of a background on myself just because I made some unique choices in not just the practice model or lifestyle medicine, but just you know, everything that I've done and how I set it up. And I wanted to kind of give you guys some context for that. Um, and then it'll sort of like all make more sense, I want to say. Um, it, I'll only spend like five minutes on that, just touching on some highlights that are all relevant. And then um, I will talk about the DPC hybrid practice. It's two separate things, right? There's two separate new things. There's like a DPC hybrid focus where you, you can just have a DBC hybrid practice. It doesn't have to integrate lifestyle medicine. And then there's the lifestyle medicine focus, which you can just have lifestyle medicine integrated into whatever you're practicing. It doesn't have to be DPC hybrid. So there's two new things here. So um, because the talk is mostly focused on lifestyle medicine, that's what I'll spend the most time on. But I just wanted to give everybody a heads up that those are the three things that I'll cover in this order. So let's start with background. Um, basically, um, my background is both my parents are physicians. And I grew up in doctor's practices. Um, I grew up delivering food to my parents in the hospitals because they were still residents when I was a little older. So I remember, you know, a lot of that. I, I lived in a resident apartment building for three, four years of my life. And I've just always been around medicine um, and healthcare. Um, in medical, in, in sorry, in high school, when I started high school, I, actually, I also started doing billing for my parents and I would go to billing conferences. I knew everything about Medicaid, Medicare, all the rules. Um, and I did a, a ton of like um, denial billing as well from the past year that my parents had a different billing service and I would recoup a ton of money for them. Um, so I'm very familiar with that. And then also high school, I wrote an extended essay on how Medicare completely changed the healthcare industry. And that is like, that was like sort of foundational um, information for me that led me to DPC actually. Um, and then going on from high school, you know, I didn't actually get into that many good schools or anything. Um, I only got into MIT and Caltech and I was trying to avoid being a doctor because both my parents are doctors. So I was like, I'm going to be an engineer. And I loved like thinking about optimization, but I did not like any of the jobs in engineering. So I ended up finding like my way into social entrepreneurship and um, in, in, at MIT and um, I won all kinds of competitions. I won like, you know, the ideas competition with with a telemedicine startup. This was like back in 2004 or five. And so it was early on with that. And um, there was like global health focus. And I loved the health, like, you know, the field and everything. So I did go to medical school and uh, went to, I went to Yale. And then I, um, in residency, I won the grand prize at the hackathon at MIT Harvard uh, Health Hackathon. I was featured in the Wall Street Journal. And then I went um, out right out of residency. I was hired as a hospital consultant and I was able to pay for all of my med school from one year of just doing hospital consulting uh, where I was doing optimization of their flow. Again, I was really interested in optimization and I had done part of my senior um, 
research work in residency was to model the patient flow in the emergency department. So I had done a lot of that and I got hired to do that. And, um, you know, I was able to pay off that. I did emergency medicine for residency, by the way. Um, and then after that, I sort of started, I had my own ideas and I wanted to try them, but none of them really took off. But honestly, I learned a ton from the experience of just starting like different ideas. And, um, and then that was sort of foundational to me launching what was called Caspia, it was called Caspia. Um, and it's, it was an app to help patients engage with their health more. And that came from my parents' health issues. And so they're doctors, like I mentioned, and I'm a doctor and we couldn't keep up with their health information. So I was like, what is going on here? How do we not have a system for this? And we had my chart, we had everything. And um, so I designed an app that let people take notes and um, integrated with their my charts and it had everything in it, like from their labs and it could you could track symptoms in it and stuff like that. And I loved it, we loved it. Um, and, uh, but people weren't using it. Um, everybody went, that we interviewed, um, you know, they either didn't do anything for this or they were using their own workarounds like a Word doc or Google Drives and stuff. And so that was kind of like, you know, it wasn't really going anywhere. Um, so I kind of just stopped doing any of these health tech developments. And I just like worked in, you know, I had started a family. So the last part of my uh, background is the last slide is that my son, when he was young, um, he started to eat solids and my husband's a vegan. So he wanted my kids to be raised vegan. And I knew nothing about vegan nutrition. My husband's like one of the least healthy vegans I know. He eats a bag of potato chips for dinner. And I was like, I don't think, you know, I grew up with dairy and I actually grew up eating meat too. Um, I became a vegetarian on my own, like when I was 14, but um, I just didn't know anything. So I started researching about plant-based nutrition and I was surprised, honestly shocked about how much information was out there. And then um, on the Nutrition Facts podcast, Dr. Greger was talking about lifestyle medicine. And I was like, what is that? So I went down that rabbit hole. I got certified in it. I loved it. I used it in the ED a lot. Patients were loving it. They were asking me, where's your practice? Like, where do you work? I want to go to your clinic, whatever it is. And it was, it was just so refreshing, I think, to them. And also to me, I was getting so much satisfaction um, with using it. I wrote a book in it. I, some of you might have used that to pass the boards. Um, I wrote a chapter in the in the group book that was written um, and um, edited by Shilpi Pradhan. And then I also opened a practice in it. And I, and I just, honestly, I love it. And I wanted to share kind of as much as information I can about how to, how I do what I do. And also information about like my profits and things like that to see if this is like gonna work for you. Um, but whatever, whatever practical advice I can give you, that's kind of what this is about. So the DPC hybrid um, model, so I heard about DPC first from another emergency physician who was like, when I was telling him about what I wanted to do, he was like, well, you should do the DPC model. And I, I kind of like fell in love with it. And he, this is Mitch Lee. Um, some of you might've known him because he does take medicine back. And that started from emergency medicine. And I was, I was like, this is what healthcare should be like, you know, like with their, you're incentivized to keep everyone healthy and work as hard as you can for them. And then you have a small group of patients and things like that. So I was really, really in love with DBC. Um, oh yeah, yeah. And so, um, yeah, he talked to me for like an hour, at least at a time about it, maybe a few times he talked to me for an hour. Um, and then anyways, I, I started my practice, but like, I had all these complicated things where if you're getting lifestyle medicine, then it's this pricing. And if you're not, then it's this, and you could just do DVC and all this stuff. And I realized like, you know, it, that doesn't work. And I just want to keep everything simple. Um, and then, so I have one DVC model now, which is just a hundred dollars a month. Doesn't matter your age, doesn't matter whatever. And then I added on insurance because I realized like my primary goal in starting my practice was lifestyle medicine. And there are a lot of people out there with insurance that isn't that bad and they want to use it. And then they couldn't get access to lifestyle medicine because I'm the only one in my area with a practice in lifestyle medicine because I was saying no to them. So I started certifying, I started, you know, like um, getting, uh, doing the process of registering with all the, all of the credentialing with all the insurances. And so that, um, that led me to the DPC hybrid model. Um, and so in the DPC hybrid model, what I'll talk about, uh oh, it's frozen. That's why it wasn't turning. Okay, yeah. So how to set up a DPC hybrid practice. 
So we'll talk about the legality of it, the contracts, the overhead, um, and that's kind of like the practical, you know, what, what are you going to spend on? What are you going to make? Um, and then strategies that I've used that have really helped me. And you can, you can have your own take on any one of these things, but this is just what I have experience with and what I've, and you can ask me like, did you consider this or whatever? And I'll tell you, you know, like how I, how, why I chose what I chose. Um, and then in terms of the legality aspect of the, the practice, you do have to, you know, check with your state laws about what kind of practice you want to form. In most states, they have what's called a professional LLC. And that's what all the lawyers and doctors form. And they have special protections. It's state-based. Um, also, there's state laws about dispensing medications. And then also, you have to look at your own state laws about taxes and things like that. Um, but if anybody has any more questions about the legality aspect, that I just wanted to touch on that because I feel like that comes up a lot. Um, and I feel like everyone has a different idea about this and it's usually the opposite of what I'm doing. So I, again, like I would check with your own sources to double to confirm, but I'm pretty happy. My patients are pretty happy and it makes sense. Like it makes sense to me, like that this would be allowed, um, in terms of contracts. So I have contracts with Medicare. I have a group purchasing organization. I have commercial insurances. Um, I have contracts with Quest. Um, their lab services. I also have contracts with wholesale pharmacies, compounding pharmacies. I give some like vitamin shots and things like that to my patients with like um, B12 deficiency. Um, I've started somebody on low dose naltrexone. There's like different things that you can use compounding pharmacies for. Uh, and I also have, I don't have a contract with imaging center, but I have like agreements with them and consultants. And all of that is to get like great pricing on things. Um, and so those are some of the ideas. I might've left out a few. Um, those are some of the contracts I have. Um, and then the overhead. So overhead, I have separate slides on that. My overhead is roughly 4,000 a month and I have it broken down for you. So I have uh, my rent and probably like staff is the biggest. I started my practice with no staff. So the overhead was like, you know, just, it was pretty much the rent. And some of these other things that you see here, like utilities, the Microsoft um, subscription, the three, Microsoft 360, the, uh, oh, I forgot to put Google uh, workspace that needs to be on here, but it's roughly around 4,000, um, doesn't go more than 4,500 a month. Um, and that will cover like, again, my staff. And when I started, like I said, I had no staff because when you don't have patients, you could just do everything yourself. And that's one thing about the costs um, of something of like of businesses is a lot of times we're used to systems where people are doing a lot of these things for us. And because I worked in a doctor's office my entire life, I felt very comfortable with doing everything. Um, and so I was, and I honestly think that was the, that is the right way until you do have like enough patience to merit, you know, the costs that you might incur from hiring people. Um, and so I set up, for example, my own website. I mean, when you have time, you should use that instead of paying somebody. Um, and so that's kind of my philosophy. Um, I do my own advertising. I went door to door, you know, like people use social media for advertising and it's quote unquote, I'm free. It's free, but I was always terrible at social media. So overhead, I try to keep flow from costs that I like things that I can handle myself. Um, and then my staff, like the, she comes only one day a week. Fridays so that's that's like um like the Friday and then sometimes she catches we catch up on on um we catch up on billing she does my billing now so she didn't know billing before I trained her she also helps me with some contracts I have with um with some big companies in Connecticut to do their employees physicals and so Unilever, Sikorsky, um you know like PwC there's a lot of big com companies that have this relationship and they pay me to do their company's physical so they're not my patients so she does she helps out with those too so that's kind of like why she comes she usually comes on Fridays um, I highly recommend the retired nursing market for employees they're very well trained they're very mature um, it's you know they know the field they know the area they know how to work with patients um, and so that's one tip I will give you um, and I found her on Craigslist so Craigslist has like a place where you can post for jobs and, and it's cheaper than everything else where you can 
um, post for jobs. And that's where I found her. Um, okay, so ways I save money on the setup. My setup was like super cheap. I think it was like 10,000, which rel is relatively cheap. I know it sounds like a lot, but some people have spent like 60,000 and things like that. I've seen like some crazy numbers out there. Um, my parents have their own clinics in Florida and they were really supportive. They couldn't come up to help or anything. I did everything like manually myself, but like they sent a truckload of furniture. So they sent like my chairs. I have these like nice chairs for patients to sit in in my office and in the exam room. They sent exam tables. I also, I didn't really like there. So I actually found other exam tables in the area that people place with different on eBay or on Facebook marketplace or whatever, people are giving things away for free left and right. Um, so you have to search all those things. So um, they also sent some computer equipment, but not a lot. Like, well, I think one monitor is what I ended up using. I otherwise bought a lot of my tech refurbished online on Amazon and refurbished from Philips for my ultrasounds. I really like ultrasound. Um, and so I bought my own probes. So I have, they cost me about 2,200 each. I have two probes. And those were refurbished. And that's part of my startup cost. So that's like $4,400 of my startup costs. Um, and then I also bought um, an EKG machine that was from Facebook Marketplace. It's a full 12 lead. That was like for $150. Um, I got a stadiometer for free there. I got scopes for free. I have a wall unit, like a well challenge wall unit for free. Um, so you can find a lot out there. I mean, I'm like, I'm not, you know, I think I, I think I'm good at, find, I'm not like the best at finding the best deals out there, but I was hovering on this on Facebook marketplace for like a year trying to find different things. Um, and I, and I have like a collection in our house. My husband was so happy when I could move into my office and we emptied, <laughs> emptied that whole area out. So you kind of have to like be a little bit aggressive, but we would drive like half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour to get this stuff. Um, what else? Let's see. Um, the medical, some of the cabinets that I have in my office. So if you, if you carry, if you hold meds, like if you get samples or anything, you have to have a lock on them. So I bought locks, but the cabinets themselves came with that place. Um, my landlord kind of like, um, he had to redo some of this place and he, that so that was all done for free. I didn't have to like do the painting and the, and the floor because he had to do it anyways um, to get this place rented legally. And then, um, and then, yeah, there was just like some, you know, other things like samples. McKesson came by when they saw that I, there was a new practice in the area. They just like knocked on the door and they had like a truckload of samples that they gave me to get started. And that's really helpful. Like, especially if you don't need to buy a whole box of something, they give you like one of each thing. And then and just so you know, like you can apply for samples from a lot of places like Johnson and Johnson. I think there's like a website where you can see all the different kinds of samples that you can possibly get. There's like one person that just never buys band-aids. They just get samples. Um, and so you could really cut down on your supply costs. Um, and then I did all my own formation paperwork. Honestly, I kind of wanted to know what they're asking to. And it does take time. I had to go to the bank like four times to get the, to get the right raising on the right document for Medicare credentialing. Uh, but I did all my own licensing. I did my own, all my own registrations. And I, and I did all of my own billing for, I don't want to, I want to say like six months before I hired somebody. So um, I was trying to control costs like crazy. I didn't want to have to work, have to take, I, I guess I didn't want to change my business model to be anything other than I wanted it to be just to meet ends just to have ends meet, you know, like I wanted to just practice the way I wanted to practice. And, um, and so that's not the most, it wasn't the most lucrative way in the beginning, but now that has paid off because my patients have sent a ton of patients to me and now my practice is fine. Um, and I, like I said, I don't, I didn't pay for contracts to get formed with patients. I don't have contracts with patients. I explained to them everything about how it goes and then I don't have any HR. That's another huge cost saving. I do everything in a Word document and a platform I just designed um, that carries my, that has all my lifestyle medicine stuff in it. And then I also do everything in an Excel spreadsheet. And I think it works great. Like I have, um, I have eFax. Um, I don't know where my costs are. Yeah, I have eFax, which is D Doximity. You can have eFax for free, but I use something called HumbleFax because they plant a tree or something like that. So I was like, oh, I want to plant, I want to help plant trees. And so you don't have to even pay for eFax. 
but there wasn't a lot of need for an EHR. Um, and and then like the thing is about EHR is like the labs and everything like that. I like to analyze them my own way. We have our own cutoffs in lifestyle medicine. You know, we have our own way. I trend things before they become abnormal. So that they don't do that that easily in any of these other EHRs, especially for small businesses. So I just I just didn't do it. Uh, and that was my choice. Um, ways I save money ongoing. So um, so that was the setup. And then I think I already talked about a lot of these. I always find like the very, I do a lot of research on what the cheapest possible things are for like gloves and EKG paper. And I just stick to that. And I just like, I just keep buying from that. I don't, in the beginning, I do a lot of that research and I just, I just stick to that. Um, and like I said, I do um, like the GPO, sorry, I just, I'm skipping around. But I do the GPO, the group purchasing organization. That's how I get the cheap rates at McKesson. Um, some people use Henry Sheen for, or Henry Shine, I don't know how to say it, for their uh, supplies. And it's similar rates. I've compared them. Um, US Pay is my merchant servicing. The fees are like less than 2%. And it's a HIPAA compliant um, processing service that I use called authorized.net. The annoying thing is you can't just like swipe and a patient can't put it in themselves at home. I have to like put it in myself. But again, like, you know, it saves money, you know, like, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to pay an EHR service $300 a month just to have that feature. You know what I mean? I can just, I'll just take their card one time and it's set up for, for their life. So um, supplies for free. And like I said, I, I, oh, so Quest and LabCorp, they'll give you a lot of supplies for free, like all their supplies for free. So it's like really not, anything that they have, like swabs or whatever, urine cups or anything. I just ask for as much as I can for free, Band-Aids. Uh, butterflies, like whatever you can, you can just request them. Um, what else? So I did a little bit of exchanging services with other people. I don't advertise that I do it, but a lot of other groups do that in DPT. So I just thought I'd put that in there as an option where you could save money. Um, and you can do free advertising by getting involved in your community. And especially if you're not busy with seeing patients and you need patients, then just go out there and market yourself and give talks and um, you know use yourself as much as you can to advertise. Um, and then I rent out two rooms in my unit and that's just nice because I get like a steady income. Um, and then virtual assistant, I have um, $7 an hour. It's cheaper than like most of the other virtual assistants. I found them myself on Upwork, which is like a really nice platform to find freelancers. Um, yeah, so the patients that are doing DBC high review, I don't know, like, um, I don't know what the question was, but Concierge, like MDVIP, they charge two seventy five a month plus what they charge Medicare, and I charge twenty five a month. So I don't consider that concierge, and I try not to use that word because I like I love my patients. They're just like regular working people. They're my retirees are on fixed incomes. They just value their health and their relationship with me a lot, and um, they value the fact that I only have three hundred patients and and stuff like that. So that's kind of like. Um, you know, you pay for what you value when you're older. And so that's kind of what I do. Uh, let's see what else. Um, okay. So strategies to gain traction. Um, what I do is I provide every single one of my patients with VIP level care. Um, it makes me feel good. It makes them feel good. And I love the word of mouth that they gave. They give, uh, you know, I have my own boundaries. Like I have a nine to four. And then they, you know, they have to schedule their own appointments and things like that. Um, I have a blind patient that I'll take her call anytime, any day, that kind of thing. But, you know, there's always like one or two exceptions like that. But she doesn't, nobody tries to abuse me. I don't have that. Um, if it does feel like that's the thing, then I just say like, you know, I don't think, you know, you want to be happy with what you're doing. And so I just don't, I just say like, you know, no matter what they're paying me, I'm just like, I don't, you know, this isn't the right um relationship or this isn't the right um office for you I think and she like I have a ton of patients that are just like all word of mouth and I love the word of mouth patients because they know what they're getting into they give you the benefit of the doubt from the beginning because somebody they trust trusted you and so it really really works out to get the word of mouth patients so if you went I, so I I love that um that providing that level of care to the people when I'm with them you know like in person and stuff like that and then I also live four minutes from my office, so I can come in in evenings and emergencies um, to keep people out of the hospital um, and urgent cares, which I do. So I, I've seen people for UTI testing on Saturdays and things like that, just because I don't want them to wait the whole weekend when they're already having other symptoms. And so I will do that. 
Um, you don't have to though, you can do whatever you need to do. Uh, and I do a lot of community talks. Like I said, that helps gain traction. And then I also limit one-offs. I don't, I almost don't do any. I don't think I do any. I think I've done like some school physicals for my patients' kids and stuff like that. There's like in a pinch, but I really try to limit it because you're, you're effectively competing against yourself. And this has come up a lot in DPC threads, but um, yeah, I don't try to do any one-offs. When I'm full, then I'll only have availability for one-offs when I'm full with my patients. But until then, I don't want to be competing with myself. Okay, so that's the, uh, I think it's a little longer than I wanted to on DPC hybrid. Does anybody have any questions right now? Um, besides what I've already answered or attempted to answer, or do you want to clarify? You can come on to speaking if you want to. Um, okay, and then the next thing I'll talk about is integrating lifestyle medicine. So first I'll go over my appointment sequence and then all the information I collect and how I built my workflow to be efficient because it wasn't always efficient. Um, and then I'll talk about some special programs. And then I really love the art of behavior change. Uh, let me see what this is. Oh, um, I use uh, AvailT for billing. AvailT is like $40 a month if you use their like essentials plan. And it allows me to bill for everyone that I see except for TRICARE Humana. And you can bill for Medicare if you link those, but I just use NGS directly in Medicare. And I like that because the, the appeals, if I ever have to appeal billing, I can do that in NGS. Um, I like NGS. NGS is like a good platform. So I just, so we use NGS for Medicare, direct Medicare, and then availability for all the other, plat all the other insurances except for, um, except for TRICARE Humana. Before we paid $40 a month, we couldn't, um, we couldn't send electronic bills through availability to Cigna. So we were just paper mailing them. And so I've, I've done everything to save money. Like it's literally just like $40 a month. I should have put that on my overhead, um, but I've done everything to save money until it became like, you know, this is silly, let's just pay. Oh yeah, so NGS is a third party contractor. It's a private company that Medicare pays. They have regional contractors. So in the Northeast it's NGS, at least in Connecticut. And that's who you submit your Medicare claims to. So I think there's different ones all over the country. Okay, so now let's get to lifestyle medicine. And so the way uh, my appointment sequence works is, um, so first I do a free meet and greet. It used to be 30 minutes when I had more time, but now it's getting busier. So I have 15 minutes. Um, and again, like, you know, if you have all the time in the world and you're trying to get patients and why not spend that 30 minutes? Just, I don't give free, I don't give medical advice, but I you know, just to really make sure people understand what you're trying to do, um, you know, like spend your time advertising. Like the way I thought about it is I'm either taking care of patients or I'm marketing myself. And so that was like kind of how I did it. And both of them are worth my time. Um, and then the introductory appointment, it used to be two hours um, and I'll talk about why. And then mem member appointment, um, if you have like a one-off issue or something like that, I have them all booked at 30 minutes. You usually don't take that long. And then the last thing is my uh, comprehensive physical. Um, it takes about an hour and I do everything in that physical. I do an EKG, I do their head to toe, I do all their measurements, I do their waist circumference, their hip circumference, I do a step test, I do hearing, I do vision. So, and then I go over their labs and everything. And there's a lot of education. Um, so the reason why the first introductory appointment used to take two hours is because this is the information I collect. Um, so there's a lot here. Most appointments, when you're just doing primary care, it'll just cover the medical history. But when you're doing a lifestyle assessment and um, then you have to collect their lifestyle information. And these are the six pillars. Um, I didn't give into details about all of these things, but it's like, there's a lot of information that I collect in each one of these. Um, I asked directly, for example, about each one of these areas of where they could eat food. I asked directly about these uh, physical activity things, the sleep -ish areas. I asked directly about financial relationships, work stressors, uh, toxic substances. I've, do you use tobacco? No. Have you ever? Yes. And then it goes into a long back and forth history. You know, like, so every single one of these, um, and then there's social connectedness, their purpose, um, lifelong partner, religious, friends, like everything. Um, and so that used to take a long time. Um, and there was nothing that I could do about it. <laughs> I, um, I really wanted to use the questionnaires and 
it was just so hard because it's just me in my practice and I didn't want to hire somebody to do the questionnaires. Like I decided to um, build my own platform and that's what I was going to talk to you about for the rest of this. Um, so I, I designed kind of a digital version of my appointment and um, I collect all their lifestyle information asynchronously. So once you sign a patient up into the platform, then they go, they get an email with their information to log in and then they get kind of like a teaser for a question. And so some of the onboarding questions will include things like height and weight. And um, then you can assign other questionnaires. So if you have a different system or you want to talk about, if you want, want to collect your, their medical information separately, then you don't have to use this platform to do that. But there is a ton of questionnaires in here for like gathering information, like their medical history, like everything on the medical history that I showed you. Um, and this, and then their lifestyle his, their lifestyle assessment as well um, can be collected through this questionnaire system. Um, and then basically I'll show you how it works. So um, once they click on that question, uh, if they click here to answer, then they're redirected to their platform to answer more questions. They can click um, one at a time and then it'll load the next question here. Um, what medical issues do you have? So this is from their medical history. So you could just type whatever. This is a, a demo patient site. Um, and then, so this isn't like a real patient. And how often do you wear a seatbelt um, all the time? So it just will ask all those questions or they could click into any one of these areas and answer their questions here. Um, you know, and then on your side, you know, like you can just see like their answers and then anything that they answered before will already be filled in. Um, and then you can go back and then you could see how it kind of updated how far along you were in this. These are some of the screening tools that they've already answered um, just by being, you know, like just, um, just this is all like, uh, like I said, dummy data. This is the lifestyle medicine intake questionnaire. So this is your overall level of health, how they think about their health. Um, overall last two weeks, how much sleep did you get in a 24 hour period? So last two weeks, so a lot of the lifestyle questions are just gonna be there. And then um, their GAD, their set, their audit, whatever, you know, and we, we actually reached out and got licenses to redistribute these questionnaires. So like the audit from the WHO, the G87 is from Pfizer. Like I didn't know who owned all these things, but we've reached out and gotten um, licenses to redistribute this. And then I'll come back to the action items in a minute, but that's how I collect the information now. Um, and then on the physician side, once you click on the patient, anything that's completed will automatically be scored for you. And then you can also review um, their information. And what I do is I copy it and I put it into my note, um, like their answers from here. And if I wanna review answers, like for example, the medical history, it'll be like free text. So I'll copy that, I'll put in my note. And if I wanna annotate it there, then I can annotate it really easily because it comes in the format of what a medical history should look like. And so they've already filled in their side, but there's always stuff that you wanna add, right? On your end. So then you would just like add more, um, however much like, you know, however much detail you wanna go into. And the same thing with the lifestyle and take questionnaire. Um, and then what else? So that's kind of like how I gather the information. Um, the next thing I do is then when they come in, in the introductory appointment, now it only takes one hour, which I know is still longer than a lot of other people have, but I designed my own practice so I could do whatever I want. Um, but I review their data with them and I go into a lot of detail so I can get all the little details that I want. Like the dietary screener kind of just like asks for serving sizes. So this is kind of cool. Like, do you avoid any categories of food? If you say no, then you could just go to the next question here. But if you say yes, then it'll just give you like, okay, what are the different categories that you can avoid? And um, anyways, so like on an average day, how often do you eat whole grains if they say zero? then that's like a problem, you know, you can go into that with them and it'll give you, it'll still give you information, but so I like to get into like, what kinds of vegetables do you like to eat and all this stuff. So, so I can give them really specific action items to follow, but you don't have to do that because, you know, everybody's situation is different. 
Um, so I review their data with them. I get a whole, I, I get a really nice picture of their medical history and their lifestyle history. Um, and then I assign action items. And what that looks like in this platform, it's also really cool. Um, so let's say that you have like the GAD7. Based on their score, it'll actually suggest some action items. And so I can assign this and it'll show up on their action plan. So I know what I've asked them to work on. Obviously you don't assign things in a vacuum. You kind of have to talk to them about it. Like, what do you think that we can do together? Are you up for keeping a gratitude journal every day and see how that goes for you? Are you up for learning about these mindfulness exercises? And on the patient side, they get the action items. And so like perform mindfulness exercises and then they get resources automatically. So now I don't have to reinvent the wheel. I was constantly just kind of like emailing people with all the different resources that I had found for different things. And I was constantly like sending them attachments or printing out attachments and worksheets. And now I don't have to do that. So um, I've sort of like just tried to digitize my flow and anything um, electronic, you know, digital uh, solutions can solve. I, I've tried to put that in. And the other thing about the platform that I use a lot is the note. So at the end of every visit, oh, sorry, this is the patient side. Um, you know, like you can complete that you've finished that and then it goes away from your to-do list to review with the patient. And the notes for that visit get done automatically. So screen tools, I've reviewed them. PHQ-9, I haven't reviewed them, but they're completed. You know, there's those kinds of things um, indicated. You can indicate that you've reviewed the questionnaires, you've reviewed the action items. Everything I've assigned comes out, comes in here. If I've taken something away, if I've edited anything, then that can come in here. Um, and then, you know, like I can copy this whole thing and add it to my note. So over here, like, by the way, you can edit the action plan items to make it customizable. So you could do every day or every week or something like that, or make the text something that you want it to be. Um, and you can make your own action items as well. So, cause I have some patients where it's like very specific to them. Um, and so that's the last thing that I wanted to show you about the platform. Um, tracking of action items becomes really easy. Previously, I had to reread my notes to see what we were working on and it was really annoying and I couldn't remember. The patient also could barely remember what they're working on. So now they can see all of their action items and all their resources. And if they have any questionnaires to answer. Um, the other nice thing about this is that you can bill for PHQ-9. Um, and I was not capturing that. And, you know, I have a hybrid, so I can capture that for my insurance patients. And um, so PHQ-9 is so much easier now because all I have to do is like administer it. And then I just click, click, and I just like, you know, it's done and I can just bill for it. So it's just like little things like that have just like increased my revenue a lot. Um, and if somebody has a diagnosis of depression, you can bill four times a year for PHQ-9. Um, and so there's kind of like little things like that that um, I wasn't able to do in my day-to-day -day work before I had a digital tool to do all this. Um, and I don't have Epic, you know, to do all that stuff for me. But even people in with Epic, like other residents at Yale, they tell me that they just do the PHQ-9 synchronously with the patient. And I'm like, nobody has time for that. You know, we're already strapped for time in our lifestyle medicine appointments. So this is just like a nice tool to kind of like capture that kind of like missing revenue. And it's stuff that you wanna do. So now benefits to the patients is that there's lots of time for them to like get the education that they came there for rather than just giving you information um, and building that relationship with you. And then they can answer their own questions on their own time at their own pace. Um, and they can even just answer one at a time. They'll get reminder emails until they've completed one of their questionnaire tools. And there's a due date associated with them. So they'll get the reminders according to that due date. Um, and it's smart forms. There's no duplicate questions. If there's the same similar question in two different screening tools, it won't ask it twice. It'll just ask it once and it'll count for both of the screening tools. So that's not like annoying, you know, it's like smart. Um, you can, they can track their progress uh, and then they receive their action plan. And we plan to make the action plan something that they can edit as well because it's supposed to be co-created. So staying as close as we can to the tenets of lifestyle medicine because that's what we're trying to do here. Um, the benefits to me, obviously it saves my time. I make more money. I was just telling you guys about that. And I don't have to reinvent the wheel over and over again. 
And um, some of the things that we have to come in this platform, we wanna do translations, we wanna do multicultural recs, we wanna have uh, patients ability to track their goals. So if you recommend like, you know, three servings of vegetables a day to start, then they can like track that, achieve their goals, that kind of thing. We also have access, we've reached out to USPSTF and they've given us access to their API. So when the patient just onboards, we'll have all the data to like give you what the USPSTF recommendations are for their age, their gender, you know, whatever it is. And uh, you can assign their mammograms, you can do whatever it is um, through this platform. There is an option as an action item to schedule a physical. So I use that a lot because I had no other way in my own practice, I don't use an EHR, you know, to like indicate that a patient should make an appointment for their physical. And so with this platform, I can do that now and it's so much nicer. Um, and the only other thing that I wanted to mention about this platform is like every single patient in this platform is going to be receiving a uh, monthly newsletter about lifestyle medicine, education, um, skill power tips. So for example, like best tips to set a quit date for uh, whatever it is that you're trying to, habit that you're trying to break. Um, and then, you know, recommendations on content to consume, like what we're reading, what we're listening to, what movies to watch, and then answering a patient question and more. Um, and that monthly newsletter is going to start in April. So um, the idea is to take more things off of your plate. Like we're all out here trying to practice lifestyle medicine and trying to give our patients content. Um, but we want to kind of like with this platform help out with that and I've been doing this newsletter and I'm like why does like you know we should all just like you know just collectively do that and we want to make that white labeled too we want to make all of the patient communications white labeled we don't have that featured yet but we definitely want to so that you will get the benefit of the patient knowing that it's coming from your your relationship with them um, and then another physician that we talked to who's going to be using this platform they um they wanted like a quarterly newsletter on the physician side about updates in lifestyle medicine research and stuff. So that's going to be something else that we're going to do. So um, I hope that's helpful for integrating lifestyle medicine into your care. Um, the next thing I was going to talk to you about is special programs that I do. So in addition to the lifestyle medicine, I have a cooking class every month. I get partnerships with that. I sponsorships. It helps with advertising. I do board games once a month in my clinic. That's tonight. It's the last Friday of every month. I'm appointed to the Council on Aging in my town. So um, I have some recognition with that. I do talks in the community I keep on mentioning and I do walk and talk with a doc. And then there's something about the art of behavior change that I just wanted to mention in this talk because I'm really passionate about behavior change. Um, and the idea about behavior change is that you're never telling somebody what to do. You're sort of like inviting them to come up with solutions that can meet their goals with the information that you're providing them like so you're kind of the bridge of gap of knowledge but um not by scientific facts or things like that just by like more mirroring well you told me your health goal is this and this is the way to achieve that so what would you like to do along those lines or you know um so the step one in, in behavior change that i've learned is to manage your own emotions so never get too attached to what you're telling the patient um just see yourself as sort of like you know, passive. And I don't know, like, there's something about it where the patient can tell if you're trying to sell them something. And that just seems disingenuous to them. And I just feel like you have to kind of like remove yourself from that. Um, and you've been there, you've all been sold something too. And you can tell from the beginning, and sometimes you let it go on and on just to see where it will go. So you can see what the catch is. Um, and so you kind of have to really understand if you're doing that. So because otherwise, they won't trust you know um and then you have to manage the patient's emotions like you have to have like a you know um i don't know trusting relationship and that comes from like their emotional reactions to anything that you say too um and then another uh another step three thing is i always start with the patient's goals so i don't care like you know some patient's goals are like i want to live to be over 100 i want to care i want to Live, I, I want to avoid cancer. It doesn't matter what your goals are. The recommendations are probably going to be the same from you, but I, I couch the recommendations within the framework of their goals. So if it's like, I want to lose weight or I want to do this, if they don't care about their high cholesterol, then they're not going to do anything you say if you just say, this is what you should do. You have to do it in the framework of their goals. Um, and then the last step that I want to mention is just include their values. 
um, like, you know, like positive psychology, what is valuable to you? Is it community? Is it service? Is it self? Is it spirituality? Is it something else entirely curiosity, wisdom, whatever it is, um, but include it as much as possible whenever you can in your interaction. And I think that's it. Um,